I'm going to be reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 8th chapter, beginning at the 26th verse. Hear the word of the Lord. Then they, this is Jesus and his disciples, arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on the land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most Highly God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What and how has this been possessed? How are you the one who has been possessed by demons have been healed? Wait, whoa. <laughs> Your name, he said. Turn to second page. Your name, he said. Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine saw what had happened, when the swineherds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in the right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by the demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the of the Gerasenes, asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of the word. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that not only would we hear your word, but that we would become doers of your word. We pray this in his name. Amen. We probably need just a little background. Uh, first of all, demons are a hard thing for us in the 21st century to wrap our minds around. But we have to remember how the people that Jesus was coming to and teaching how they interpreted and how they defined demonism. And for these people, it was very, very real. And for that in fact, today, there are still many people who also see uh, demons to be very real spirit entities. And of course, the argument is if we have the Holy Spirit, we have the Good Spirit, we have the Spirit of God, there must be an opposite spirit, which is of the evil. We know there's a lot of evil in the world. We know it doesn't come from God. Where does it come from? It comes from uh, our own free will that we have because we are free to do bad things as well as we are good things. And people will say it also comes from this spirit of, of evil that seems to surround us and be constantly begging us for its attention. But regardless of how we look at it now, we have to say uh, the people of the Gerasenes would have believed completely in this man's demon possession. In fact, they banished him out of the town. They were afraid of him. He must have became very strong as he was uh, uh, seemed to be demon possessed because he had broke his shackles. He broke how they tied him down, and he broke loose many times. He had run around naked, which probably didn't go well with the people of the village yelling and screaming and getting into people's faces. And they also believe that demons mostly hung out at night. It was, it was worse at night to go out because you were more susceptible to demon possession. Hung around cemeteries or tombs. 
So if you were out at night and went through a cemetery, then it would be doubly bad. And they mostly attacked people who were isolated or by themselves. So if you went out by yourself, you went out at night, and you went to the cemetery, there was a good chance you were going to be demon-possessed before you got home. And it's amazing how throughout the centuries, our own television, movies, and all that kind of bolstered these kinds of thought. If you watch anything on the channel Chiller, if you watch anything from any of the Spielberg and all the other kind of science fiction, uh, metaphysical kinds of things, you'll see many times that the cemetery is the setting, it's dark is the setting, and people are alone the setting when they are haunted by these demons. Now, there is another school of thought with this demon possession that this man had. And I'm not saying whether it's true or not, and I'm just giving it to you um, because I feel that you should have all the information that the scholars have thought about this particular scripture. And that is that much of the demon possession at the time was attributed to something uh, like seizures, uh, epilepsy, uh, psychosomatic, uh, mental illnesses, and uh, a large portion of psychosomatic. If, if they were told they were demon-possessed, they believed they were demon-possessed, they acted demon-possessed. And this also then would hold with their theory that as Jesus came off of the boat, as this demon-possessed or psychologically demon-possessed man began to shriek and began to scream, the swine that were feeding on the hillside were startled, just like I startled four or five people when I came in, and they didn't see me walking in this morning, and I said, good morning! <laughs> and they jumped. Well, the pigs jumped, and the pigs stampeded, and Jesus, knowing that this man was psychologically sure that he was demon-possessed, said, look, I am casting the demons into the pigs and off of the cliff they went. Now, of course, this didn't set well with the people of the town. After all, the pigs were their... Well, for one thing, the Romans used pigs for sacrifice. But the Romans, unlike Jews, probably ate bacon on their BLTs. <laughs> but anyway, the pigs would have had value for the herders. And people say, wow, you know, destroy that economy, destroy you know, perfectly good pigs. And then, of course, the argument is, what's more important? The life of a human being or a herd of swine? So that's the backdrop of what we have going on here. And so what I'd like to do is look at a couple of the reactions to what was happening at that particular moment in time and see if we can't take away something that we can take away for ourselves even now in the 21st century. The first person that I would like to look at, of course, is Jesus himself. Everything that I can gather together from the three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who report the same incident, this was probably done uh, very close to darkness, if not dark itself, or at least at dusk, when it, the disciples and Jesus finally got there. They had come across the Sea of Galilee, there was a horrible storm. The, the, Jesus was sleeping on the, in the bow of the boat, in the aft of the boat, and the disciples woke him up and said, don't you care, we're about to die, and he calmed the storm. This was after being out and feeding 5,000 people and doing all those other kinds of things. It was a long day, it was night coming, and they finally got to the other side of uh, the Sea of Galilee. They put it in the port, and here comes a screaming maniac right at them. Jesus must have thought, you know what? Enough is enough for one day. Haven't we all felt that way? Enough is enough for one day. I know there were times when I had four children all under the age of five. At the end of the day, enough was enough. And I had yeah, ruckus man back there as testimony to this. And I remember when my firstborn was born and how we celebrated and went on and on with this and how happy we were. And she turned out to be six-month colic. 
And I remember walking around the dining room table hour after hour after hour, and this poor kid would just scream in my ear until it finally scream itself to sleep. And I thought, enough is enough. And in ministry at times, I have been out and I have been going all week long. I have been doing everything I can possibly do and working. It's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight. The telephone rings. And I'm, Lord, please, don't let it be the church. <laughs> don't let it be some kind of crisis. I wouldn't answer it if I didn't have to, Lord. But I have to. We all have had those times. But Jesus must have seen that this absolutely could not wait. This man was running through the, the tombs, through the caves that were in the limestone rock above the sea, and he was cutting himself. He could have cut an artery. He could have been dangerous to somebody else. And Jesus did a quick triage and said, this has to be done now. Which I think reminds us that we have to learn how to do triage. We have to learn what becomes a crisis situation, what is a crisis from someone else might not be an emergency for us, but we have to be able to discern this. And I, I submit that as we get older in age, we learn to do that in a better manner. It seems that wisdom does come with age sometimes. And I'm thinking, these are my golden years. These are my wonder years. I wonder where we parked the car. <laughs> I wonder what day it is. And I wonder where my iPhone is. And that wouldn't be so funny, except there's been times that I've been running around, I'm upstairs, I got the iPhone in my hand, I'm yelling downstairs, Cheryl, call my phone. I can't find it. And then it rings. There's been times I had it said I was watching Netflix on my phone. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I gotta, I gotta call, I gotta call so-and-so. And I start looking for my phone, I'm sitting there watching it. <laughs> it just becomes so much of a part of us. But we have to be discerning. There are times when we have to jump, when we are called, and there's times to have patience. Jesus always knew the difference. Somehow, we together need to learn those subtle differences, be able to do the triage. And when it is an actual crisis, we can never walk away from the need. Because that's what Christ has taught us. You don't walk away from the need. There's never a time that we don't have compassion. There's never a time that we don't have mercy. There's never a time that we don't exercise grace. Because that's who we are. That's who Christ was, and that's who we are. So we have Jesus in this setting, and he's very happy to be able to heal this individual. And the man is sitting at Jesus' feet. He is now clothed. He is calm. I mean, you would think he'd be jumping up and down for joy. You'd be think he'd be shouting hallelujah. But I think there comes a time when we can have like a paralyzed joy. You know, it's just so overwhelming. It's so awe-inspiring. It just strikes us. But it's almost like we just have to sit there and absorb it. And he's sitting there absorbing this, and here comes the town people. Pum, 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 pum. And they're angry. We heard what you did. You got them there a swine to go over the cliff and into the water, and they died. And they decided they were going to be afraid, afraid of Jesus. What if Jesus would have had those demons come into us instead of the swine? There is this Jesus, he, he destroyed our herd. There is this Jesus who is very disturbing. And Jesus is still very disturbing, is not. Jesus disturbs us at so many levels. Jesus disturbs us when he says, there are hungry people out there. And they're your responsibility, not responsibility for them, but your responsibility to them. There are people out there that have been rejected. They are your responsibility, not your responsibility for them, but your responsibility to them. Do the triage. Go to them. There are people out there who are abused. 
And they need your counsel. They need your embrace. They need your understanding. They need your care. Are we disturbed enough to go to them? And that can become disturbing. It could cost us some of our own possessions because we have so much, shouldn't we give some to people who have nothing? Because Jesus says, if you have two coats, you should give one of them to somebody else. And if you take that past what he just said to everything else there is that we own, you can simply say, it's disturbing. Does Jesus really mean that I'm supposed to do that? And the answer is, yeah, he does. You can't get away from it. It doesn't mean that you should live in poverty or take a vow of poverty. But it means we should have a sharing, caring, compassionate, graceful, mercy-giving heart. These people did not have that heart. And we had the man himself. Man, there he was. And he was healed. We don't know how long he was like that. But I take it it was quite some time. And now he was healed. And his first thought was, Jesus, I'll go with you anywhere you want to take me. And what did Jesus tell him? Mm -mm. That's fine. I understand that you're all emotional right now. But this is the very instant of your change. And what I want to do, want you to do, is I want you to go back to your home. I want you to go back to your village. I want the people there to see your change. I want you to go back there and show them that you're not the screaming, howling maniac that they chained out here in the tombstones. You can give them hope. If they see this drastic, wonderful transformation, new creation, they will know they too can have this new creation. <laughs> Remember in college in a writing class, I was sitting there and, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, I've, this is really not the easiest thing in the world that I've ever done. And it's not just writing, you gotta write, you gotta rewrite, and rewrite, and rewrite, and rewrite, and rewrite, and you turn it in and they come back and say, rewrite this. And I was feeling a little bit ignorant with the whole process. And the professor was up there writing something on the board and started writing a word. And, mm, mm, <laughs> stood back, didn't know how to spell it. And this is the writing professor. There is hope for me. <laughs> I can't be any dumber than that. But the point really is, there has to be a way that people can say there is hope, even for me. Uh, going through that this morning early, I was thinking, I wish I had something that would say that in kind of a concrete at our level kind of a way. So I found this on YouTube this morning. And I thought, this really does say there is hope. There is hope because there is care. There is hope because people who are disturbed walk past being disturbed. And it is placed in Cedarville, Ohio, and it's after a tornado. This after tornado came through a farm, totally leveled the place, picked it up and set it back down, nothing but rubble. After it picked it up, set it down, nothing but rubble, it rained for, I don't know, six to 12 hours steady. So you have the feeling this is total rubble and devastation. And there was a reporter, I wish we had a big screen. There was a reporter that was out walking around the rubble, and I'll see if this will work.
Now, when I watch this closer, this poor kitten is a calico kitten. And it was very hard to see. And whenever he heard it, he went down and he saw it. This kitten was like in shock. It was just shaking all over. And he picked it up and he put it into his coat. He put it into their truck. He warmed it up. He, he comforted it. He did everything that you would do with someone in crisis and in trauma. And it's a kitten. It's a very small kitten. And yet his heart was able to take that in. Then, miraculously, he found the owner of the farm and he gave the kitten to them. And they were ecstatic. And they said, we have lost everything, but now we have hope. Because there is life after the rubble. And they knew that they had life after the rubble. And how much more then was this man who was out there and saved and healed, much more than a herd of swine were the fears and the disturbance of the people. And so that's what we have to question. Are we ready to be disturbed by Jesus? I think that's really... And then are we ready to act upon the disturbance. Hey, may God bless us.